So today is Monday, May 1st, uh, 11 a.m. section. This is being recorded for being posted on the web. Uh, so again, welcome to the home stretch of 443. So just a couple of logistics, and then we'll talk about homework 13 <coughs> and your final group projects. But as we get started here today, uh, first, you'll see that uh, course surveys have been open. I know you're getting lots of reminders to fill those out, so please take the five minutes or so to fill them out for 4.43. It is always appreciated to get your feedback on the course. <clears throat> uh, in terms of what is upcoming this week, as we get into our home stretch here, uh, first of all, Wednesday, <clears throat> May 3rd, is the last day to turn in the assignment replacement. Okay, so one more time, for any of these individual assignments, any of the 13 homework slash extra credits, plus <clears throat> the Bloomberg certification, okay, if you do that homework replacement paper, which is 500 words, then what we'll do is we'll take either an assignment you missed and give you full credit, or the biggest gap between the points available and the points you scored and treat it as if you did it, got a perfect score on it, and if you had missed it, treat it as if you didn't miss it, and if you did it. Okay, so again, for those of you trying to opt out uh, of the final exam, this might be very useful for you, but you have to complete this by Wednesday. So Wednesday is the last day to, to turn in that assignment replacement paper. Okay? The other thing <coughs> that's coming up this week, we're done with all the homeworks, is group project, two of them. Uh, one is the Bloomberg Trading Challenge. Part two ends <coughs> Wednesday, May 5th, or sorry, May 3rd at 5 p.m. Okay? So again, don't liquidate your portfolios. If you go above 300,000, your team will be disqualified in cash. So don't get out of cash. Make sure you have 10 longs for the second half of the semester, or else you'll also be disqualified. But basically, at the end of the day, Wednesday, after we finish the presentations, <clears throat> markets are closed, I will basically take screenshots ranking you uh, on how you're doing. Okay? And so, just as a quick check in, idea. this is section 101. Everybody's done in this section, which is great. The 10 longs, available cash under 300,000. So this is the scoring as of today. And we can see this is the team that is in first place. Okay, So uh, if the trading competition were to end today, basically first place gets five points, then four, four, three, two, one would be the point distribution. We got two more days worth of trading. But that would be the ranking as of today. Right? So hopefully no questions about the trading challenge other than please get that done by Wednesday. Also, <clears throat> uh, there is a peer review for the Bloomberg Trading Challenge. Again, everybody should have been contributing throughout the semester. If you're not trading, actually at least making ideas. So if anybody didn't participate in the trading challenge, opportunity to, to say that in the peer reviews. Okay? And then the other thing that's coming up on Wednesday is our final group project on multiples, group case multiples. All right, so Wednesday, which is our last live class, all the teams will present, 10 minutes per team. I think you know the, the standard practice for those presentations, use numbers. And what you're going to have to do, and the assignment was posted for Parker, is they're in three segments. So make sure that you get two peers in each of their three segments and then explain why they're trading at a premium or discount for each of those peers in each of those segments. You also have to put all the data, including the screenshots, into your PowerPoint slides. Okay? So again, all of that needs to be done on Wednesday. And unlike the valuation presentations, which I think many of you got done in about seven minutes, you're going to need all ten minutes to get through all of this. So my recommendation, don't just come in here and riff. <laughs> okay? Practice. All right, go through it in advance. Feel free to be scripted. I know you've done some of that in the past. It will help you because you've got to get through all this in 10 minutes. If you run out of time, 
then it will work against you in terms of your final grade. Okay? So that's going to be Wednesday, which will be our last physical day in class together uh, this semester. And then same thing, peer reviews for that <coughs> will be due on the multiples by Thursday night. Okay? And the reason why those peer reviews are due Thursday <coughs> and the projects are due Wednesday is that starting on Thursday, and I'm having a call with the TAs tomorrow night, but I told them our absolute deadline for all grades, all assignments, including homework 13, Thursday. Okay, so all the points have to be in by Thursday okay, for all the assignments, right? And so by the end of day Thursday, <clears throat> with all the points in across all the assignments, we'll then on Friday apply the homework replacement. Okay, so if you wrote the paper, on Friday, they'll then take all your points, look for the lowest score, apply the homework replacement. After they apply the homework replacement, they will then apply the opt-out criteria for the final exam. Yes, sir? Um, if the grades are by Thursday, and the homework assignment replacement is Wednesday, and some homeworks aren't in, how would we know to do it by Wednesday? You'll, you'll have to kind of take a guess. So I'm just telling you, 500 words is like a little over a page. You guys are good at that these days. As an insurance policy, write it. Can't hurt. Okay, so that would be my recommendation. But you will have to choose to do the assignment replacement before all the grades are in on Thursday. Unfortunately, just the way the timing is going to work. Right now, <clears throat> yes, sir. If all of the grades are due then, will all the midterm exam grades be looked at? Everything. Yeah. Matter of fact, I found out over the weekend because I was talking to Chris back and forth on email. I was like, Chris, where are your midterm grades? Why aren't they there? He's like, they've been there. I was like, no, they're not. What happened was there was a posting error. So for his section, as an example, just a bunch of people didn't have their grades posted. So they were they're graded, you just couldn't see them. So that might have happened to a couple of other stray people. So it's all going to be there, all be posted, you will see it, uh, and it will be available. Yeah, so there's a notification saying that they were all posted, but then, like, I know myself and a couple other students for, well, yeah, as I said, I'll be looking through that myself to make sure they all get posted. But everything will be posted and graded no later than Thursday. Should be sooner than that for your case. But the idea is on Friday, <clears throat> they're going to be doing the uh, basically final exam opt outs. That's what's important to you. Okay? So you don't have to tell us whether you're opting out. They will apply the opt out criteria, which will include all of the uh, no more than one unexcused absence this semester. And again, I have two piles that I haven't fully entered in, all of the sheets for your sign-in, and then I have all the emails, which I've kept about all of your excused absences, which will be applied. So all that's got to be done this week will be up there. So the excused absence <laughs> policy will be applied. Then all of the individual homeworks will be applied. Basically, you have to do all of the homeworks, right? And you can't get zeros on those, no more than 50% uh, grades on those. For the midterm exam, you had to score six or ten or higher. Okay, you also had to do the group projects. So the group projects don't have minimum grades. By definition, your Bloomberg trading challenges. Some teams are not going to score very well because it's a relative basis, right? So as long as you were peer reviewed for non-participation, group projects do not apply, right? If you were peer reviewed for non-participation, they will apply. You won't be able to opt out of the final exam, and if you were sent to the honor council for any reason, you can't opt out of the final exam. Okay. So we're going to apply all those criteria and then on Friday. So either end of day Friday or first thing Monday morning, what's going to happen is for the people that can opt out of the final exam, right here there's an assignment called final exam opt-out points. Right? If you're able to opt out of the final exam in that assignment, we will put 10 points. Okay? And that will basically tell you that you got the 10 points, you don't have to take the final exam. So we'll make an announcement. And when you see that announcement, check your opt-out points. If you can see 10 opt-out points, you're done. Thank you for a great semester. It was nice seeing you. Enjoy your summer. Okay? And for graduating seniors, good luck. Right? If you didn't, then you'll take the final exam one week from Wednesday. Okay? In class time, or at least, at least class time. And again, it'll be a 10-question, multiple-choice exam, open book, covering the content this semester. It is cumulative, no other way around it, right? But nonetheless, <clears throat> you'll see a zero, and that's your clue that you take the final exam for up to 10 points. 10 multiple-choice questions, one point each. 
Okay? That will basically be one week from Wednesday. Okay? Because it's scored multiple choice by ELMS, you'll know the end of the day that Wednesday what your score on that exam was and your final grade for the semester. And that goes back to the grades. Right? In the grade book, one more time, ELMS is misleading about your grade. Okay? Because ELMS is not set up to have more than 100 points available for the semester. It just doesn't know how to handle it. Because ELMS, by default, the system is set up to do a percentage of total. Okay? So when it looks at the grades, it will look at the percentage of the total. And because there's more than 100 points available this semester, that percentage of total will be lower than your actual grade. Okay? So again, it's points across all assignments. And again, if you want to get an A- minus in this class, you need 90 points across all of the assignments, including the extra credits. So I don't look at the percentages in ELMS. For actual grading, I export the grade book after all the grades are in, and I sum up all the points. That translates to your letter grade. So it's the sum of the total points. All right? But you'll have a pretty good idea, especially if you opt out by next Monday, what your letter grade should be. Okay? If you add up all your points. And then it's just standard letter grades, 93 is A, 90 is A minus, 87 B plus, 83 B, 80 B minus, et cetera. As a finance or accounting major, the most important number is 70 or greater. All right, you need a C minus or better if you're a finance or accounting major to pass the class. And A plus, because there's more than 100 points, it's not 98. All right, you have to get probably like 102. I gotta see where the distribution is to get an A plus in the class. Not that many people care about that, but there's a few who do. All right, so that's kind of where we stand. So Wednesday will be essentially your last physical day here. There's no class on Monday. You use that for final exam prep time if you have to take the final exam. You'll take the final exam on Wednesday, basically during the class that you're registered for. So if you're in the 11 a.m. section, you take the final exam. You'll take it from 11 to 1230. You'll take it on ELMS. Individual exam, no cheating. Questions about any of those kind of end of semester logistics. So again, two other peer reviews to do this week if necessary. And as I mentioned last week, uh, for the fall, I'm going to have another 170 students across four sections. So I'm looking for four new undergraduate TAs. If anybody is interested in that, fill out the application. The requirements are you've taken the class because they're only, only considered TAs that have taken the class before. And a lot of you have been going to the TAs for help. Hopefully you appreciate that they've actually been able to talk to you about assignments they've previously had to complete themselves. Uh, <clears throat> basically pays $15 an hour um, and uh, you work 10 hours a week. So that's basically what that represents. All right, questions about any logistics? So let's talk multiples. This was mostly an easy assignment, but it was not standard. So I asked you to estimate and explain meta, alphabet, and apple. Okay. And so the question is, what was their spreads? Right? So I think the cost of equities, which I did over the weekend and the wax, pretty straightforward. I don't think we needed to really make any adjustments for these companies. So the wax and the cost of equities and then the PEs as, as of Friday were the data that we saw. The only thing you might have had differently is the day you did the multiples would have changed your PE and your multiples because at the end of last week, for example, Meta reported surprisingly good earnings and their stock price jumped dramatically. So depending on the day you did it, if you did it before the earnings were released, you'll have lower multiples than after the earnings were released, which actually drove up the stock price and drove up the multiples. So that might be different. Okay. So again, because we're dealing with some earnings releases last week, might have changed what your actual multiples were, but this is as of end of day Friday. Okay. So then the question became, okay, what is the spread of each of these companies? So let me start with Meta. And we'll start out with their EEO when we looked at their cost of equity. So Meta's return on equity, sorry, return on equity, pretty straightforward over the next four years. Um, I ended up choosing 20% for 
for perpetuity, but out year was 19. They were low 20s before that. So I would say somewhere between 19 and 23, 24 is probably an answer you should have had for Meta's expected return in equity and perpetuity. Uh, for Alphabet, better known as Google, Uh, they're pretty much around 25% every year, so 25%, assuming that continues. And then the other one was Apple. Apple is going to be a challenge for their return in equity. Okay? Now here it was like 160, 140, 109, 59.9. All right, so I ended up choosing around 60%, but two things. Once you get to a 60% or plus return in equity, you'll notice in the key value drivers, whether you're doing 60% or 100%, it's not gonna make a difference, right? Because the whole point of return in equity or ROIC is when you have an extreme ROE or ROIC, what it practically means is you're not reinvesting much to make the profits, okay? So incrementally, a very high ROIC or ROE is not gonna make a difference to the key value drivers, okay? I chose 60, you could have chosen 90, it wouldn't have made much of a difference, right? The reason why their return in equity, and this is also gonna affect their ROIC is very high, is two things. One, we talked about this earlier in the semester, which makes Apple a little bit more of a challenge, is that they outsource all their manufacturing to Foxconn, so that gives them an extreme operating ROIC. And the other thing is Apple is, is basically the most prolific, prolific buyer of common stock in the history of the world in terms of the dollar value. They're just buying back tens of billions of dollars of stock every year, okay, because they're generating so much cash that they, and they don't have a lot of investment to make since they outsource their manufacturing, they just buy back huge amounts of stock, all right? And so that is somewhat distorting the equity because they're buying back the equity at market prices and they issued it originally at book value and the market price is so high, they're wiping out their equity, okay? So that's also driving those returns on equity even higher. Okay. So again, I'd use 60%. You could have used a number 60 plus or pretty high. Okay. So but that's important because it goes back to the next slide. Here is Excel. All So if I look at the operating ROICs of these companies, for Apple, I put in 50%, okay? And you might say, where'd that number come from? Because if you looked at the current Apple ROIC, it's like 600%, okay? The reason I put in 50% is because remember, there is a correlation between ROIC and ROE, okay? Because ROIC times your your debt to equity ratio is basically your ROE. So that's the point. If I'm putting in a 60% ROE, then I have to estimate an ROIC that syncs with that ROE, okay? Now, since Apple doesn't have much debt, okay, I'm assuming a very low debt to equity ratio. So therefore, 50% ROIC driving 60% returns in equity. Okay, so that's basically where the 50% ROIC came from. So the ROIC and ROE have to be related. Same thing. If I had chosen 100% ROE, I'd probably be choosing a 90% ROIC, all right, for Apple. But the same thing is going to apply. Once you get 60, 70, 80, 90% ROICs, it's not going to make much of a difference to the actual multiples, all right? So whether it's 50 or whether it's 100, you're still going to have very similar numbers. <coughs> Because at that point, you're seeing extreme returns. And what it basically says financially is Apple is not reinvesting much to get their profits. And that's conceptually what's happening to Apple, right? So nonetheless, the whole point is there should be some correlation between your ROE and ROIC. And for Apple, that's what I had to put together. Does that make sense to everybody? Questions about that? Okay. But that's going to apply to Alphabet and Meta. Okay, so the same thing. What is Alphabet's ROIC going forward? 
Well, I chose 25% and here's why. Unlike Apple, Google has no debt. Okay, so their debt to equity ratio is zero debt, 100% equity. So basically, whatever their ROIC is after tax, it's gonna be pretty close to what their ROE is after tax. Okay, so that's the point. For Meta, or sorry, for Alphabet, I chose a 25% operating ROIC because they have a 25% ROE. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming that they're gonna be relatively close together in perpetuity. So again, these two numbers should tie together. That's the key point of this exercise, right? And the same thing with Meta. <clears throat> Meta, which again, back to ROIC, they have a little bit of debt. If they have a 25% ROE, uh, I chose a 22% ROIC. Sorry, 20% ROE, I chose a 22% ROIC. Okay, so again, closing ties, they have a little bit of debt in their capital structure. So essentially creating those three spreads. Okay, tax rate, got two of them off of company guidance. The other one, and I forgot whether it was either Meta App or Alphabet, uh, had to look up the annual report from JP Morgan or the annals report. So those were the three tax rates I got, right? And then based on the multiples, solve for the Gs, those are the high Gs. Five, four, four for Meta, four, seven, two for Alphabet, 6.2 for Apple, and same thing with the other three companies, pretty high Gs. Now, again, if you had made your spreads higher, your Gs might be slightly lower, but the point is all three companies have a lot of growth, right? And even before we get into the exercise, if you've been reading in the press about the tech stock challenges, right, particularly over the last year, the entire conversation is about growth, right? Because that was the point. The reason why tech stocks were so valuable is because of all the growth. Amazon was the growth of the cloud, right, in addition to the growth of online retail, right? Apple, to some degree, is the growth of its services business. All right, which is now like a, almost a $30 billion a year business. If it were broken out, it'd be listed separately as a Fortune 500 company, okay? So Apple's growing outside of the iPhone and some other areas of technology. There's gonna be a lot of interest next month at their annual developers conference about virtual reality. Like Mark Zuckerberg went there, nobody <coughs> bought anything except for the porn companies. We talked about that before. So Apple's coming out with their VR headset. Does that actually spur the market so that somebody behind Meta is out there trying to get you to do goggles that go more than gaming and porn, okay? And so is this actually gonna be a practical business application? So there's gonna be a lot of interest. So it's not whether or not the first one sells a lot, but like does that actually jumpstart another growth vector for the technology companies? Right? Just like AI is another big one that people are thinking about for Alphabet. That's their potential growth vector beyond their search engine. So that's the whole point. There's an expect, expectation of a lot of growth. That's why growth, these companies have been so valuable. What stumbled over the last six months is as we've gotten to tougher economic times, whether or not there's been a speed bump in some of that growth, but that's the whole point. These companies are growth stocks. So they're gonna be very sensitive when you get high spreads to different levels of growth. And that's what's gonna be behind your multiple analysis and ultimately the DCF values of all these firms. Is how are they gonna do in these growth markets it's going to have a big impact on their valuations. And that's what we're seeing here in the multiples. Okay. So if you're explaining this, <clears throat> back to PE, you know, Meta is trading right now at a discount to Alphabet and Apple. Right? Why? Why is their PE trading at a discount? Well, if you look at Alphabet, <clears throat> they're trading at a slight discount, not because Meta is expected to grow faster than Alphabet. They are. They're G6.23 against Alphabet's expected 5.51. Meta's trading at a slight discount because Alphabet has a slightly bigger spread, about 15 points <coughs> versus about 10 points. And Meta has a slightly higher cost of equity of 10.3 versus 10. Okay, So the little bit of extra risk at Meta and the slightly lower spread at Meta is why Meta's trading at a slight discount to Alphabet. Okay? <coughs> the reason why they're trading at a big discount to Apple is Apple has slightly higher expected growth than Meta at a much, much higher spread. So that's why Apple's trading at a big premium. No surprises here with these numbers, why the, the multiples are where they are, um, and they should be relatively straightforward and easy to explain. But questions? 
Yes, have similar numbers, similar explanations. Questions about any of this? All right. And in a way, that's what I want you to talk about proxy for Parker Hannifin. Right? So why does Apple have more potential growth? Right? And it's not just the iPhone. The iPhone's not, it's kind of flat, it's mature. It's the other businesses at Apple that are very important to Apple's growth. But you can see it in EEO. Because if I go to the EEO for Apple, revenue, 394 billion to 464 billion. So that's the point. That's dot, dot, dot. At that scale, that's a lot of growth in terms of revenue, in terms of dollars as well, not just percentages. What's behind all that growth? Where's that growth going to come from? That's what the market's very concerned about, but also the opportunity because they think they're going to do it. That's why they're trading at a premium. Okay? Look at what's happening in Alphabet. They're expected to go from 233 billion last year to 337 billion. That's 100 billion of revenue growth in the next four years. It's like 40% growth. So that's the point. <clears throat> a lot of growth. That's that high G. Okay. Even Meta <clears throat> is expected to have a decent amount of growth. All of these are growth stocks. Meta revenue expected to grow 116 billion to 169 billion. Right. So as much as Mark Zuckerberg's getting hammered by the market for having to do layoffs and cut back on expenditures, it's not like they're not still growing. They're still a very critical advertising platform that's making a lot of money. And we can complain and moan about Facebook, but you're still using Facebook. And you're still getting a lot of money paid associated with that. So that's where that growth is, is coming from. So back to when I'm explaining this, the context, what is driving the growth in all these companies, make some references to when you talk about the G's and the G differences as the key context numbers for your analysis. All right, then we go over to our EV to sales and EV to EBIT. All right, we see a similar story. Meta is trading at a discount to both Alphabet and Apple for similar reasons. For Alphabet, why is Meta trading at a discount? Well. It's trading a discount for very clear reasons. Number one, Alphabet has a bigger spread. Okay, 25 minus 9.8 is much bigger than 22 minus 10. And that 9.8 whack gives them a slightly better multiple than if they had a 10% whack. In fact, you can even play it out here, make this 10%. The multiple will be slightly lower. But the real reason is because that's slightly lower, or slightly higher, I should say, is two things. One, Alphabet has higher spread, and Alphabet is expected to pay a much lower tax rate going forward than Meta. That actually does make a difference. Okay? Because again, if Alphabet pay the same tax rate as Meta, 20%, their multiple would be below Meta's. So premium at Alphabet is driven both by their operating spread being higher than Meta's, and by their tax rate being about seven points per year lower than Meta. It's actually substantial in this example. And that is why they're trading a slight premium, despite the fact that Meta is actually expected to have more growth than Apple, than Alphabet. Okay? 5.44 versus 4.72. Why is Meta trading at a discount to Apple? Two things. Apple's got that gigantic spread. Okay. Apple's a little bit more predictable company, so they have a lower whack at 9.6, and Apple actually has a higher G. So they're kind of hitting all three, higher growth, higher spread, lower risk. All three are basically allowing Apple to trade at the premium in the industry. Okay. <clears throat> so pretty straightforward. The hard part of this exercise was not explaining the premium or discount. The hard part of this exercise was getting the spreads. Okay, what are those perpetuity spreads? All right, and my recommendation here in this particular example was, if you can forecast return in equity, you can back into an ROIC. The opposite could be true. If you can forecast ROIC, you can create a return in equity. All right, that would have been true if we used defense and aerospace stocks where defense aerospace stocks didn't really have reasonable returns in equity because again, they've been buying back all their equity 
and, and so they don't have any equity. So what is the return on equity when you don't have any equity? Right? Well, again, you can use your ROIC in a cap structure to estimate essentially what the return on equity should be if they hadn't bought back all the stock. Right? So there's a relationship here, but the key is what is the right spread in perpetuity? That's true for any analysis, whether we're doing DCF or multiples, in the way you think about the future, then the premiums or discounts tend to emerge. They, they're pretty straightforward once you get those numbers in. Questions? All right, third ratio, EV to sales. EV to sales, as I said, all things equal, it's driven by margin, but if the productivity is different, which means the ROIC is different, then ROIC will affect the EV to sales, All right? Why is Meta trading at a discount to Alphabet in their EV to sales? Well, they make more than Alphabet does, okay? 32.9 operating margin versus 31.9 in Alphabet, All right? But interestingly, Alphabet in the real margin has a higher margin than Meta because their tax rate's lower. So the no plat margin at Alphabet is 27.8, the no plat margin at Meta is 26.3. So even though the pre-tax margin's higher at Meta because of the tax rate advantage that Alphabet has of paying 12.8% versus 20%, then that actually allows them to make a higher profit margin on the sales. And Alphabet spends $1.11 to generate sales, Meta spends $1.19. So two reasons why Meta's trading at a discount. One, they make less than every dollar sales after tax. Two, they're spending slightly more to generate their sales. That's why it's 4.44 Alphabet for EV sales and only 4.34 at Meta. And again, pretty understandable when you kind of look at the data. All right? Why is Apple EV to sales the premium at 635? Well, pretty straightforward. Apple, even though they don't have the margin to Meta, 29%, Pre-tax versus 33% pre-tax, 24.6 after tax versus 26.3 after tax. Apple spends less than half the amount of investment to drive those sales. And so the return on the investment in the sales is much higher, and that's why people pay a lot more for Apple's sales. That's why it's at a premium to Meta. 6.35 versus 4.34. Again, questions. Questions about any of this. How the numbers played out, what they mean, because this is what you're going to be doing in your group projects in two days. So back to your group projects. I have posted this, I believe. haven't, I will, I thought I did. I didn't. All right, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to call it homework 13. And in homework 13, I am going to put this solution, okay? So if you're just tracking, just in the interest of time, because you may or may not, by Wednesday, get your homework 13 graded. Just kind of want to see what I did as a solution you got in the video. You also have the homework 13 solution file. Okay. It's posting it for expediency. So that is homework 13. So back to Parker. For Parker, Remember, when you go to RV for your group projects, off the BIX list, you can use global or regional, but either way, you're using the BIX list, three segments. Flow control, aircraft and parts manufacturing, diversified industrials. So if I go to flow control for the multiples, pick 
So let me go here to custom. <clears throat> I have a saved multiples template, which looks at the multiples that we use in this class. But pick two companies beyond Parker, and I'll let you choose who you want to do to explain. All right. But as I said, if you see somebody like row 118, Enterpack Tool Group, which doesn't seem to have any calculable multiples by Bloomberg, I wouldn't use that. All right. Too hard to explain. All right. But as you go through this and you're kind of doing the, the math, pick two easier companies that are easy to explain, premium or discount, but you'll pick two companies off of this list. You'll pick two companies off of the aircraft and parts manufacturing list. And then it's going to be Parker against each of those two companies in each of those segments. Why trading at premium or discount for all three of those multiples? PE, EV to EBIT, EV to revenue. So two companies off this list and two companies off that list. So seven total companies. Make sure that you're putting the screenshots, the EE of the wax, for all those companies. So that's seven companies times two screenshots. That's 14 screenshots that are going to be in your PowerPoint. Make sure they're there. And everything is in that PowerPoint to explain this across the three industries. Just like I did for the valuation, I'll probably post later today one or two samples from last semester's PowerPoints that did pretty well. So if you want to see a format of what that could look like, you can use that as a, as a helpful guide. Okay? But that's what you're going to be doing on Wednesday, 10 minutes per team, last day of class. Questions? All right, so <clears throat> before we wrap up today, I'll just summarize a couple things. Uh, so what we've done this semester, which hopefully has gone by pretty quickly for you, uh, <clears throat> as I told you at the beginning of the semester, I, I started to show you how a sell side analyst starts to look at companies and how they do valuation. And so we went through the four parts, okay? We talked about EIC as a method for understanding that external environment. Because I said on day one, half the performance of any of the companies is what that market that they're in, that industry that they're in, right? And understanding how attractive that market is and how it's gonna look over time is gonna be really, really important, right? And, and that's something that's pervasive even beyond this class, but we saw lots of illustrations in this class and we, we came up with a way to start communicating what those changes would be. As a matter of fact, if you look at what's going on today, ECFC, you start to see headlines Probability recession, 65%. <clears throat> Federal Reserve has kept interest rates high, like it's starting to slow the economy. And right now, you see two things happening with the economy. One, job growth has slowed to a crawl. It's still positive, but it's slowing to a crawl. It's on a, it's on a vector down. If interest rates stay high with all the layoffs people are having, we're going to see challenges with good job growth in the coming months. And then the other thing is this fight that Congress is having over the the debt limit is going to impact growth. If for no other reason than when you look at the components of GDP, one of the components of GDP is government spending. And that's the point. If the government spends less, GDP is going to be lower. And we're going to have this debt limit fight about reducing government spending in a period of time when the government's already heading towards a possible recession. In a way, it could easily tip us into a recession. Right? Now that may be even a political calculation by some, I hope it's really not, because a lot of people would suffer because of that. But regardless, I'm just saying like, we already talked about this, which companies are going to be impacted more or less by recession. There's an interesting article in Bloomberg yesterday that said, if you actually look at the tech sector, which is done poorly, there's only seven companies in the entire sec tech sector that have actually done well year to date. And they're responsible for most of the reasons why the market has not collapsed. Outside of those seven companies, no one's doing well in tech. And we wouldn't expect it to because we did EIC. One of the things we talked about in the first week, first couple weeks of class is how companies that basically were dealt with consumers, technology to them, were impacted in recessionary times. That's what you're seeing play out. By the way, do you know who the seven companies that have exceeded expectations in a terrible tech market? Who are they? They're all up about 30% on average year to date. The rest of the tech sector is not, it's flat. 
Who are they? Apple? Who else? Meta? Two? Name the others. Five to go. Microsoft is three. Apple, Meta, Microsoft. Who else? Yeah. Salesforce? They are not. They're actually one of the poor performers. Yeah. Alphabet? Alphabet slash Google, four. Who? Amazon, five. Yep. NVIDIA. NVIDIA. Doing really well as we go into AI and all the tech stuff and all the cloud stuff. Six. Remember who number seven might be? Yeah. Salesforce of sixty dollars per share the last series. Okay, they weren't in the article, but they right. called number eight. <laughs> but but I guess here's the point: the companies that we just named are the big brands, and they're the big brands in the markets that they dominate. And so those companies are right now perceived to do well, even in tougher times, with the growth opportunities that you just saw in the EEF, right? And so that's the point. The market's looking at them as the potential winners in this market. If you don't have all that growth and you don't have that dominant position, those are the companies that are not being scored to do well in the next couple of years. So it just goes back to EIC, looking at the attractive markets. These companies are in very attractive growth markets still, despite our tough economic times in the short term, that's why you see the EEO, I just showed you all that revenue growth in those companies, very, very attractive. That's why I'll give you another hint, in pharmaceutical, the company to watch is Eli Lilly. Okay. I think Eli Lilly is gonna have a spectacular next 12 to 18 months. Past performance is no guarantee of future performance, don't put real money on this, this is only an academic conversation. So I want you to be buying your Eli Lilly stock with your tuition money and coming back and blaming me if something bad happens. Okay, so this is not an actual recommendation. But that being said, why is the market so enthusiastic about Eli Lilly? Yeah. Manjaro. Manjaro is actually supposed to be more effective for weight loss than Ozempic. And the real point here, the estimates for weight loss are $100 billion a year of annual sales for weight loss drugs. And so right now we're at the early innings of what these drugs are going to sell, but I'm telling you, number one and two are going to be Manjaro and Mzempic, Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly. <clears throat> and that market, which right now is about $10 billion a year, is expected to grow to $90 billion, $90 billion more per year in the next few years. This is a huge blue ocean. So back to market opportunity, huge market opportunity. They're the two dominant players, a lot of opportunity for growth and profitability under their patented drugs. Okay, that's EIC, all right? Now, they could screw it up. You know, something could happen, regulators don't approve this stuff because they're, they're afraid. The regulators are actually afraid to approve this because the government and the payers are gonna have to go fund the $100 billion a year that they're not spending for a drug category that didn't exist before. So that's the fight and, and whether or not they're gonna pay for the drugs in the US. But nonetheless, this is a huge market opportunity. That was EIC. We then talked about the historicals, the ROIC trees, the CFIs, I know you don't like thinking about things in terms of the economic format. It's not gap, it's not standard accounting. But I hope you saw that when we did go back and looked at these things, it gave you better understandings of how companies were performing. Okay? Because the ROIC tree is a really clear explanation of what's going on with the ROICs, which is critical, and the CFIs tracks the cash. Okay? And eventually companies are worth the sum of their cash flows, and the past is no guarantee of the performance in the future. But at least we understand how and why the companies are doing what they are doing. It's a good way to benchmark. And it's a good way to set up our forecasting, which led to point number three. Then we got an evaluation, okay? And we built a reusable model in Bloomberg to value companies. Now, if you go to the EEO and you look at the company-specific metrics, you'll see that the analysts, which use a very similar process to what we did in valuation, go a little bit deeper, okay? So if you're gonna be forecasting Lilly then you're not just forecasting total revenue, you're forecasting revenue by drug and adding them all, all the drugs, right? We didn't get to that level of detail of, of you know, the click down of what's behind the revenue, but conceptually, we built reusable models that are very similar at a very high level to what Wall Street is trying to do, okay? And basically, from an intrinsic value standpoint, we also did the extra step of the as is, which gives you a better understanding of working backwards in the academic formulas, what assumptions probably reasonable to equal the current share price. Then we talked about bull and bear, which is a way of thinking about risk. 
Because remember, in diversification, the whole point of portfolio theory is tell me the volatility and I'll tell you the risk. It's basically price against volatility. Well, that's the point. You're giving volatility by giving a bull and a bear individually to a stock, right? And that helps us understand upside downside as opposed to just the target. And that's useful for portfolio managers if they're actually allocating a portfolio. Because I want to know the volatility. I don't want to just know what the price is. But that being said, conceptually, we went through a pretty good methodology for doing cash flow evaluation. That will serve you well, regardless of where you work. And then we're doing multiples, right? Multiples are just rearranged key value drivers. I and mean, that should be the message that's kind of coming out of the analysis that you're doing. It's got to be very related to the DCF, law of one price. And you better understand why companies are trading higher or lower than others, right? It's just not just arbitrary. You don't just trade at the average, right? You trade at the average because your price spread multiple, growth spread multiple is average. That's what makes you average, right? You're going to trade above average, you're going to have a higher growth spread multiple. You're going to trade below average, lower growth, growth spread multiple. That's what you're explaining. That's what you're, you're seeing. That's what you're doing. And so hopefully by taking this class, it made you better at understanding all this, right? You know, that textbook, I know not all of you read every chapter of it, but I will tell you, that's the Bible, okay? You work on Wall Street, you work in the financial community in London, you work in Hong Kong, that book's on your desk, right? Almost every finance professional's been through it. They understand that. It's the best laid out concepts that we use on Wall Street. So if nothing else, you might sell it back because it's an expensive book. If you bought it, return it to the library, whatever you need to do. But I'm telling you, you're gonna be professional. Keep an eye on that because that will help you and serve you well as you become a professional in doing all this. So I'm just, because we're not gonna have a lot of time on Wednesday, I'm saying thank you today for all the effort that you put in. I know you guys worked hard. I mean, that was the whole point of the class. Like, the point of the class is I make you do a lot of work, right? But you're better for it, <clears throat> and, and you know the material. That's why I'm very comfortable with the opt-out of the final exam. You know, three-fourths of you will opt-out of the final exam because if you did the work, you know the content. And, and you guys have come a long way in the last three months. So thanks for putting up with me. Uh, good luck on Wednesday. Look forward to hearing your final presentations. Police practice, so you don't run out of time. And we'll see everybody on Wednesday. Have a good day. Where's the sign-in sheet? Make sure you sign the sign-in sheet before you leave.